please send them in. Absolutely. Okay, so who do we have today? We've got Amma Franks, who is uh, yeah, amazing, all the way from Pretoria. And then, of course, we've got Mr. Khan Wobi from the Pilot Ones. How are you guys? Good. Great, thank you. Good. Are you good, though? Are you good? <laughs> well, healthy. Yeah. You're healthy. Yes. You're healthy. Yeah. Fantastic, man. I, I, I must say, so the reason we've been broadcasting so late is because we have massive technical problems. But these guys have been so accommodating, and uh, we've only got one camera now. We had a multi cam set up. It was an absolute disaster. But I brought you here today to talk about to talk about songwriting and, and kind of how, how you guys approach songwriting for young songwriters out there, and, and maybe even guys who are music nerds like yourself. I've got a good authority with the theory there. Yes, I am a, uh, a little bit of a music dork. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you're the best of friends. Already, we've had conversation. Already, already. Yeah. 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 So, so first things first. Um, I'm assuming you think I'm not a theory nerd. No, I'm easy. Just excuse me, Alex. Who really wants to know that? Before we get to music theory, let's address the elephant in the room. COVID nineteen. That's not a name, an elephant. Yeah, it's like a dinosaur that's been uh, resurrected. Dinosaur, yeah. <laughs> How's it been? How's it been? Um, yeah, I think it's been uh, various uh, iterations of uh, my sentiment towards it all. Um, you know, I, I think we'll all be naive to think it hasn't, isn't going to affect us or hasn't affected us in some regard. Uh, you know, I think the, the very essence of what we do as musicians um, has changed so many times. Um, you know, a few years back, maybe a decade ago, we realised that uh, you couldn't sell music anymore, that you almost had to give that away for free. But that was fine because there was sort of a trade-off because you then became a touring band and, and live music was highly made you were living. And obviously this the whole COVID-19 thing completely obliterated that and there's no sort of indication of when in the future that might return to normal. I know, right? And and music is such a it's such a it's such a personal thing. And when and when you've when you've got a crowd of people in front of you, you as a musician draw off that that energy. Like if you've got a cut crowd, let's face it, the, yeah. the whole the whole gig just feels slow and it's like the longest two hours of your life, you know, depending how, how long your show is, obviously. Um, but then you've got these people that you're feeding off, and when it's a high-octane show, it goes by like that, you know? Mm. So now, where do we see ourselves as, as live performers? I mean, is that dead in the water now? Or, well, what do, you, what do you think? From my side, I think there's quite a silver lining. I think there's quite a lot of um, newcomers to the industry that can instantly hit the platform as hard as, for example, you guys who have been in the industry for a long time. So... The, the playing field's a little bit leveled in a way in terms of people being able to go from their bedrooms and perform where they are most comfortable. Because often, you know, when I was on stage a lot, I would think to myself, I'm in my bedroom, you know, to, to calm down the nerves, to, yeah. to yeah. connect on a different level, to not be distracted too much. So I, I'll just be the optimist to say, actually, now you don't have to believe that you're in your room. You are in your room. Yeah, it's kind and of you're as comfortable as you would be. It, it's kind of a bit like radio in a sense now, where it's like you can't see your audience at all. Well, I suppose it is live TV, but in in a, in a much more sort of uh, live live way. It is raw. I mean, there's no sort of vocal effects. It's just you and an acoustic guitar, um, or you and a bass guitar, whatever it is your instrument is. And now you're sort of leaving yourself as vulnerable and even more exposed as you would may, maybe going up on stage in front of twenty thousand people, because now you don't know what your reach is, yeah. right? So, yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, well, I mean, I think, because we did a show last week that was a digital show. Um, it was amazing, by the way. I saw it. It was incredible. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, the only, for me, there's still a, there's such a disconnect. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and there's certainly a charm, and, and something that I would embrace, obviously, of, of doing a digital show or the performance in the lounge or bedroom or whatever the case is. Um, they, they all have their little magic, but it's very hard for me, obviously, to ever replicate that that union exactly. you know, that you kind no. of had. Um, you know, the energy in the room. That sort of and the, the, there's a conversation, even though we're delivering music. There's a, a conversation that happens. With I think that's the people a that are in the room. completely okay. So here we go. You guys at home, if you're watching now. Um, Give us, a, give us a yes or a no. Does the bedroom muso still do it for you? 
Is it the same as going to a live show? Uh, is it different? So many layers to that. Yeah, is it, is it, is it different? You know? um, give us a comment. Carl's going to read it out and we can talk about it. Because, I mean, do you, are you disappointed when you realize that your favorite artist um, does use a little bit of auto-tune and, you know, gets the, 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 the sweets add, added to him? Or, or do you like your, your, your favorite musician as raw as a carrot being pulled from the ground? Let us know. <laughs> Let us know while we put our lounge inside your lounge with your consent. Okay, so um, Kyle, you're a yes. music nerd. Right, here's a question for you. Do you think it's an advantage being a theory-driven musician or a creatively-driven musician, if you know what I'm talking about? Um, personally, I think it's a balance between the two because, I mean, growing up, I had zero um, technical training at all, nothing. But I really wanted to study music. My parents eventually let me after saying, you have to study accounting first. I dropped out after second year, told them I can't do this, I want to do music. And I walked in at the age of 20, 21. I bet you're regretting that now, hey? <laughs> it's not the ideal situation for the question in this pandemic. <laughs> but yes, I walked in with zero background, did the, did the foundation course at VIT. So until that age, which even now is, was most of my life, I was untrained. And I learned to write songs and I learned to sing and learned to play guitar under those conditions. And then I did my formal training through Wit School of Arts thereafter. And I have always found that I'm using elements from both. And hardly ever is one more important than the other. So I believe there, there really has to be a balance with where you trust your gut, you trust your ear, and you trust what music has become to you over all the years and how you encode that meaning. And then use technical knowledge as a tool okay. to bring that across. Completely. I completely agree with you. Okay? But my counter argument to that would be, for example, I know Khan shares uh, a very similar thing with me. I can't read music at all. And I basically, if it sounds good, I use it. You know what I mean? And I find my way around a chord progression and a chord structure. And it's sonically, if it pleases me, then I'm sure it's going to please somebody else. Yeah. Because I must have a similar taste to somebody else. That's kind of how I approach it. But then you get a guy that might come along who's got loads of theory knowledge and take that product that you've maybe recorded that's got such a, you know, it's got a heart and soul, that little demo. And then they, they start applying all the rules uh -huh. intentionally yeah. and almost iron out the magic in a sense. Yeah, it, how, it, it depends. I mean, that's where arranging comes in. You yeah. Know, it's, how, it's how, okay, it so, so, so how, how, how much of your, of your music is self-produced and how much is it like external producer? Well, <clears throat> we've always worked with a producer, um, and uh, yeah, I guess there's a, uh, it's a symbiotic relationship. Yeah, definitely. But uh, certainly not to the extent where they go, change that chord, or do this, or take that out, you know, it's always been a conversation where we go, we like that direction, we like your, your input, or... Is there, is there a Palatone's formula? Do you guys have a formula that you kind of go to? Um, that's kind of... Not a formula in a sense. I know there's a through line. I get that there's a sound. And a large part of that sound is your vocal. I mean, without that, I think the Palatone's would be a guitar, bass, and drums. Uh, <laughs> so, but you know what I mean? So that, I mean, often the... Good heat, guitar, yeah, bass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, so we love you guys. Yeah. Hey, we love you guys, but... Yeah. But, but we also love calm. We also love calm. We also love. <laughs> but I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like the uniqueness for me of the polytones is effectively um, the the vocal, uh, very much like Coldplay as well. Chris Martin's got a very distinctive voice. We can go on. Dave Matthews, uh, Sting, uh, all of the the big front men out there have a very distinctive tone. So, so is that the formula, or is it the song structure, or who's the chief writer? How does the writing process go? Because I'm sure it's going to be different for you. Because you, you, do you work with a collection of people or is it just you? Well, I, I'm actually here mostly to hear what the master next to <laughs> me has to say. So I'll definitely give him the stage on this one. Well, I mean, the way we've kind of worked it through most of the years is I would primarily come with the foundations of the song. Um, I think first and foremost, my <clears throat> primary love is songwriting. Um, you know, I, I, I don't... I uh, consider myself a good vocalist or a good guitarist or um, a you know, good musician in, in those 
aspects, um, not even with songwriting because I'm still learning. But I, but I, I'll come I, back to that. But I, the 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 thing that I love to do is to write songs, and um, you know that, that's the journey, and. Um, Whatever materializes out of that is, is... I completely hear you. I completely hear you. And you know what? Saying that you're not good at something... I, I've got that, that massive thing where I'll sit next to somebody of that caliber over there, okay? Who technically is so sound. No, you, Frank. So I'm looking at you. No. You know, you're technically so sound. And then all of a sudden I pick up a guitar and I'm forced to... to I feel like almost match your skill level. And I think it's, it's not about that. It's yeah. not about that. I think there's... What Carl said earlier is about that kind of chemistry between the two, the harmony, the balance. Because... My dad always said to me, it's not what you do, it's the way that you do it. Mm -hmm. So you can have four chords and a good story, and you've got a number one. That's yeah. how country's written. You know, it's like, not even four chords, it's three chords. And then yeah. maybe the fourth in the bridge, if they're feeling a little bit adventurous, you know. <laughs> so so it, it is, and it is very much about your approach, how you feel on the day. How you feel on the day, because, you know, I find that if I'm recording something and it's a little demo, right, and I do it the next day. I, I can't recreate half of what I was feeling. It's a, it's a, it's a there and now present thing. So that's why when you take it, like a vocal yeah. take, it's like you're in the moment. You've got to go there and you go and record it. You know. So I don't know. You know what, do you, what do you guys think at home? Uh, maybe young songwriters. Do you have any questions out there that you want to ask these two guys? I mean, you're not going to get a better opportunity to <laughs> ask them um, you know, how to start a song. Where do you start a song? I start a song with, with um, the chord progression first. Because then I actually do a lot of the production and then I kind of listen to it and, and the song makes me feel a certain way and then I apply the lyrics and the melody to that because it evokes a certain feeling in me. But I know a lot of people write the lyrics first and then add melody and composition around that. How do you do it? I would like to hear what Khan actually has While to say. you guys have just put that question, I just want to give some feedback when we asked how people are feeling about yeah. live yeah. music versus these virtual shows now. They're saying they're really grateful that there are live virtual shows, but they're really missing the live factor of just being in the same room as everyone else, having that, you know, in the flesh experience. And it seems like that's what everyone is really missing. So there's definitely something to that. Guys, we are literally live streaming from Unit 7, Sundowner Office Park. Come visit if you feel like you want to be in the room. Come, come visit. No, but I, 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 totally, I totally hear that as well. I mean, I watched, did you guys watch Global Citizen? Uh, or snippets of it, case, yeah. 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 I thought it was cool and it was a great idea, but I think it was executed poorly. Yeah. I just don't know if there was a any real cognitive sort of through line. They kind of Lady Gaga got an idea and they said it Amal Kabel, hello, Hanid Luffy, and then they all just sent in their <laughs> random videos, you know. And there was no real quality to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fact. This is a fact, all guys. Yeah. Camels have two hearts, and Lady Gaga is from Boxburg. Okay. <laughs> So it's like Lady Chacha. So it's Lady Chacha. Lady Chacha. Tani Chacha. Tani Chacha. So you guys are going to play uh, a tune for us. Uh, are you going to go first? You want to go first? I'll go first. Yeah, so it, I yeah. think maybe let's... Uh, let's uh, she will be back now now. We're going to quickly set up a tune and then we're going to talk about the tune afterwards. We'll see you in a bit. the masses there's safety in our love for each other so share the night and your feelings your senses and put real good effort in it's the season for So soon 
As we free ourselves, we're never alone. And as we swim against the masses, there's safety in our love for each other. So share the night Ooh. and your feelings, your senses, and put real good effort in. It's the season for sentiment, yeah. Even if there is no answer, as we free ourselves, we're never alone. And as we swim against the masses, there's safety in our love for each other. So share the night and your feelings, your senses, and put real good effort in. It's the season for sentiment. Dude, 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 you got bass chops there, my man. Hey? Who would have thunk it? You could play a bass guitar like a normal guitar. Who would have thunk Who it? Who would have thought that? <laughs> hey? But there's so many strings. Yeah, there's still, yeah, but there's six strings. You got six yeah, strings. Well, yeah. actually, Connor's telling me I'm mostly playing up here. I should saw off the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then it's probably going to sound like a ukulele, but like a deeper, a bass ukulele. Yeah. So, yeah, dude, song, what's it called? Uh, I'm actually going to allow the viewers to give me suggested titles. It's an unreleased piece. Um, so I just call it the Together song. It is dedicated to all the lovers of lockdown. Hey? How uh, many babies are, are there going to be after this <laughs> lockdown? Hey? 2020 baby boom is going to be hectic. <laughs> 2020. Yeah. 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 I, know, I know a lot of people are like, they have to kind of like name their baby and like after a circumstance. Like if you have it in Benoni, it's like Benoni Williams. Um, when, uh, how so often has that happened? Quite a few, I mean, I'm pretty sure. Pretty <laughs> sure. Right, back, back, back me up here, Facebook. Um, I, but I really call our kids like, you know, COVID-19, um, Shabalala. Or, well, I hope I don't have that many kids. Uh, yeah, well, okay. You, yeah, you've got we already know. School, bro. Yeah. You've got three, three kids under five? Yeah. Hey? Yeah. Mm. Three kids under five, man. And you, are you, are you great yet? How's grade before the three kids under five? Yeah, I mean, okay. I hear you there. I hear you there. You, you've got great hats. Are we going to talk about your hats as well? Yeah. You've got great hats. We're, we're talking about your song. Sorry, man. Oh, we got yes. sidetracked. You. So, we're going to get everyone else is going to get an opportunity to kind of cool. you know, to, to, to name it. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, everybody can give me uh, names for that song if they like. Um, what the song? I came to uh, talk about songwriting. So, I prepared yes. this piece because in a phenomenon of Earth, uh, life on Earth, We've got physics, which explains, and this is where the dorkiness comes out now, uh, that the atmospheric pressure of Earth gives us sound, right? So sound wouldn't be the same if our atmosphere wasn't the same. Um, so we are actually quite privileged to have music. I think it's incredible that the phenomenon exists. Um, once again, something like air pressure makes a big difference. So in my mind, what this song, this particular one, displays well, when I think of songwriting, I almost put that into one realm of three others. If I look at music as a, a, a greater phenomenon, I'll put listening in there and general awareness of sound, and then I'll put jamming in another sphere. And yes. sometimes you kind of have to tie a lot of that together to get that same magic that you were talking about. Completely, of, I hear you. And, and, and you run the risk of, of the music feeling, I think, wooden if you're in one of those realms too much. Yeah, what and you yeah. deep down? Uh, a wooden <laughs> instrument. <laughs> I wouldn't believe it. <laughs> so, okay, cool. So, did you write that for the show? I, I wrote it sort of a, a while back because I thought it would be nice to collaborate with some brass players. Yeah. Um, you know, so also I'll give the viewers an opportunity to tell me what other instruments you might hear in this. 
um, as I will still go into the production. Are you, are you, are you, so you're producing an album right now, like a COVID, yes. COVID album? Uh, yes, it, it was just going to be the 2020 album. Um, it has <laughs> sort of turned into COVID. So it was a vision before the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and now I'm busy building this album. My vision was to record it in 2020. And I'm very grateful that that was the only vision. I didn't say I was going to release it. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to record it in 2020, which is now hopefully still possible. Uh, yeah. uh, who's, who's producing? So I'm in a, a communications with uh, Mr. Simon Ratchet. Ah. So hopefully the two of us will... Uh, from Locke, am I right? Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. he also runs uh, Sound and Motion Studios in Cape Town, Los Angeles, uh, Dar es Salaam and London. Oh, my word. Can we just have a shout out for Locke? It was one of those yeah. bands that really defined me in my kind of beginning stages as a, as a, as a, as a young, come, up and coming songwriter. Yeah, big time. And I listened to them for the first time. I saw them in Grahams at Grahamstown Festival. And I remember driving back from the Grahamstown Festival and we kind of left super early and I just bought the album. It was like a five track EP. And oh, what a memory. And I was driving and as the sun came up, this music was playing and it, was, it just hit me straight in the heart, man. And isn't that what music effectively is? It's like this sonic, release it's, it's a language that that really everybody can speak and everybody can understand because we can all make music in some way some, some of us just mm. in the key of b fraud suspicious and the other one is in like you know c major so <laughs> key of <B> yeah. <laughs> suspicious b fraud suspicious that's when you sing like this and it sounds good that's b fraud suspicious okay okay so but you're still making music, however unpleasant, maybe sonically pleasing to a cat, but to us it's my. But I still think everyone is capable. But the point I'm trying to make, and I'm rambling now, is that it is a language that we can all ultimately understand. Mm. And we're all universal receivers, we're not all universal donors, in a sense, you know? Um, and isn't that wonderful? Because that, that song of yours is amazing. I was, I was listening to it now. I mean, being in the room and being on the broadcast are two very different things. Yeah. But, you know, when you're hearing the full roundness of the bass and your vocals and the approach and how you're doing it and the nuances and the technicality, fantastic. Well done, dude. Another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I offer you guys a beer? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Yes. All right. It is a non-alcoholic beer, yeah. so we cannot be, uh, uh, be put in any, any, any res what's it? restrictions, no restrictions. We're trying we, to can't get arrested, no. we cannot get arrested. My, my producer so like says we cannot get arrested. So we are, we are good. Ah, thank you. Cheers, guys. Yeah, what are we sure drinking we'll, uh, there? Uh, oh, cheers. You touch the top and I'll touch the bottom. Yes, yeah. Touch. Social distancing. As you can see, I don't know if you guys can see, but this yeah. guy over here, there's a, it's yes, a cleverly disguised microphone, but it's Uncle Cyril. Cyril distancing. Um, that's super important. You know, we, we were making, we're keeping, keeping ourselves thing. We, and also, I think, can we just say, we sterilized everything beforehand. Um, we haven't touched each other. We haven't hugged. We haven't kissed. Uh, there was uh, no contact of any kind except now for the beer. Uh, but we should be fine. Hey. I think we're fine, yeah. yeah. Cheers to Cheers. you. Right. Cheers. And your wonderful show. Thank yeah. you. Um, Cheers to yeah. legends. Yeah, man. Thanks, guys. <laughs> and yes to many, many more. And uh, just a big shout out to everybody. Uh, Lebo. Um, what's your name again? Oh, that's helpful. Thanks. Yes, uh, uh, Kyle. <laughs> 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 Kendall. Man, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Kendall. <laughs> um, a big thanks. Thank you, Jared. And to everybody that's you know, been slaving. You guys don't understand how hard it was to to even just get this broadcast out today. It's been immensely stressful. So cheers to all of you. Cheers. Here we go. Cheers. cheers. One of many. <laughs> this is a really good time to, to explain to you guys what the little basket code is in the corner over there. Um, it's not a shameless punt. Uh, it's not a cheap way of trying to make money. What we are trying to do is create a bit of uh, funds to be able to fund this platform and keep it running uh, to keep uh, entertainment and musicians alive and uh, just, yeah, hopefully grow it into something quite special. Like I said earlier, it's about people coming on the show. You could be a scientist, a rugby player, a graphic artist, a stand-up comedian, or a homeless guy. And if you've got a story to tell, you can come and tell it right here on uh, MTL. Right, Khan. I actually just want to go on to something that you said regarding yes. Yes. Uh, the atmosphere that creates sound. <clears throat> and it just triggered something in my mind, but I didn't want to interrupt you. Mm. Is it's actually such a layered word because obviously there's the scientific word atmosphere mm. but the adjective atmosphere pretty sums up pretty much sums up what you're missing by doing a lounge gig you know and streaming yeah, because you know often that's that, that is the, the, the context that we all why we gravitate why we want to go out 
is to tap into some sort of an atmosphere yeah. on an esoteric sort of hippie. Yeah, but it is. I mean, but it, effectively, it is. It's all esoteric, man. Yeah. What we do is esoteric. It's the most esoteric job in the world. I mean, as creatives, here we are um, trying to function in um, a very right brain orientated like society you know what i mean it's like super academic the way we approach school the way we do everything is a very sort of um so we've got a very academic approach to it you know and then it then suddenly it becomes very sporty and i find that like arts and culture tends to you know take a little bit of a backseat specifically in this country and yeah. you know, if we're honest i mean you know i remember like when i was at school like we didn't really have like theater as an option and then all of a sudden it became a subject, uh, in theory, you know, one side and left, and, and then music kind of grew in its So the arts, in terms of an accessible subject for a kid who really wants to pursue it as a career, is quite difficult to do here, what it was with back then. Now I suppose it is a little bit easier, but the environment in which we as South African musicians try to earn a living is hard, because the South African music industry is so tiny and violent. Well, I'm actually I'm reading a book at the moment. It's quite appropriate to <clears throat> this time. Yeah, it's, it was written years ago called uh, Black Swan or Black Swan. I don't know if you guys know it. But uh, he talks about these anomalies because humans try and predict the future. We try and live these careful, sheltered, bubble-wrapped lives, you know, scared of risk and scared of all these things. And suddenly these things occur out of the blue, um, like a financial collapse or COVID-19, um, and it's called, it's called the Black Swan because years and years ago, everyone thought there was only white swans because they'd never seen a black swan until you see the black swan. So we kind of live our lives going, this is how it will be, this is how it was in the past, therefore the future will be X, Y, Z. Suddenly this little when he comes around and changes it all. Okay, so that's the premise of the yeah, book. But in that he talks about the way society has moved, specifically in the arts and music, is it's almost uh, a winner, the winner takes all. So you either Lady Gaga or you a phenomenal oh, vocalist friend. giving, giving um, lessons to school kids to do to suffer the same fate, potentially? Well, no, I, I, yeah, I, I think I digress, but basically the, no, but I, I hear the, the when it takes all theory is you either Google or you just, uh, you some IT brain that's probably working at a bank table. Uh, but, so but, like, but, but, <laughs> but why is that? Is it because, is it because um, we are steered in the direction of a certain genre or certain genres of music or certain type of artist or type of musician that makes sort of mainstream all go in that direction? Is it that some people are just better than others? I mean, there are some super talented muses out there that have very little recognition or stage time or on a platform, mm -hmm. like the idea of the winner takes all. I mean, Lady Gaga, I'm not taking anything away from her, she's a really pretty decent songwriter. No, no, she's, phenomenal, you know, phenomenal. She is, singer, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. She's a great singer as well. But what makes Lady Gaga better than um, Susie von Rensburg in her house in Benoni, who might have as much, if not more, talent? Uh, is it uh, circumstantial? Well, is there's, it there's another, another book that I read that yes. kind of covers that aspect called Outliers, where it's, you know, it's kind of the, all these junctures that have to combine so you have to put in hours, you have to be good, um, but sometimes it's your geography, you know, um, and then obviously there's an element of luck. Um, so sometimes the city you're in just favours, say, rock music, um, and the label's all there, and you just happen to be born in it. So big reason yeah. I came to Joburg was because of the music scene, and it was happening, you know, originally being a Cape Town boy. The Cape Town music scene is very different um, what it was when I was, I'm talking like 11 years ago. It was very different to the type of music that I wanted to do. The rock scene was sort of pumping up here, you know. And it just sort of had, um, you know, the, 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 the nude girls, um, Just Ginger, and the like, Hog, Hoggity Hog, and, 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 Amisham, uh, to name how many, um, was sort of coming out. And there was a new sort of generation of, of the rockers coming in. But Joburg was certainly the hub. So do you think it's definitely location-specific? Well, it, you can... Because you're from Pretoria. I mean, you might as well be in the middle of... 
I'll be get back. Yeah, and, uh, sure. It's far. Um, so, Pretoria <laughs> Jab, we've got like one city. No, no, no. no just, <laughs> so the one house that we've got in Pretoria has been working very hard now mm -hmm. during COVID. Um, no, but what I say, I always think about it, like, about it like food, the way you described it now. Like, there will be a city that is famous for rock. Like, I mean, Detroit used to be that, and then it became that for hip hop. Um, so there is a little bit of a like tour the world to taste the flavors of the different geographic areas and you'll find great Latin music in Brazil. Everybody knows that. So you'll go there to find the authenticity of that at the same time. But something that is just from my optimistic point of view, in a way, only when music sales actually plummeted and failed did we allow for the whole world to develop their taste? It was like the liberation of taste only happened when a certain part of the mechanism of the industry wasn't there anymore because that part of the mechanism of the industry, who surely was only really trying to provide for the listeners, was also specific to content. So they had to push what was part of their agreement. This is where you had record labels who would push their bands and look after their bands. But at the same time, we wouldn't necessarily have the choice that we have now. We, we, we are in that geographic area, so we get fed this, and that is where we latch on. Whereas only after that sales model kind of drowned out, did people go, well, what do I really want to listen to? That's an amazing point. And I think the internet has given a mm. huge kind of uh, boosting to that kind yeah. of thing. It's given you access to the bedroom musician, the Justin Bieber that was found online and then suddenly became this mega superstar that mm. people now want to be. You know, everyone wants to be this, 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 this thing that is Justin Bieber. And he is a worldwide -like phenomenon, you know. But again, the ge geographical thing, it's kind of, like, kind of like cooking in a sense. Certain tastes come from certain areas. Like in one place in India and another place in India, the talents will be completely different because there is yes. different influence from there, you know. And I think that if we look at, for example, South Africa as a size, we are the same size as Texas, to put it into perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So our population fits into Texas. How do we fight? How do we, how do we stay current? How do we, how do we make a living? Look, I think Texans, people who live in Texas, have a little bit of an easier time feeling like they are a unity. And that's, I think, been a South African musician's issue a lot of the time, is how do I address our nation as one audience? That's a very tricky thing in South Africa. 11 official languages, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and so you mean 11 verses for every song. And yeah. each of those verses has to represent the South African language. Exactly. So, yeah. And within those individual yeah, languages, there are different, different sects and cultures and offshoots. I mean, how do we cater for such a diverse country? But isn't that a wonderful thing? Because our country is incredibly yeah. diverse. I don't and think you do. Yeah, we do. I, I know, but I don't think you, oh, you, don't, think you, you do. don't try and cater. Yes. You, you cater for your, yourself. And I mean, it might sound selfish, but I think we all got into music because it made us feel a certain yeah. way, and we were inspired by a certain style, and, and, and obviously what you initially do is you imitate, and you go down that journey, <clears throat> and I don't think you should go beyond that. So you're saying honest, honesty, honesty is the best thing, don't try and be somebody yeah, well, else. You make it for yourself, yeah. and there will be some people out there that like it, some that don't, mm. and, but if you try and go... It will be contrived if you say. It will be contrived. Okay, okay. well, how can I uh, pan to this audience? What does that audience say? But, but, but in saying that, right, you can emulate somebody and have an influence. Like for me, Chris Martin is a massive influence in, in my musical kind of world. Journey. Yeah. My journey, yeah. Yes. I started off being very much like trying to emulate him, in a sense, but then found that if I channeled a bit of him and kind of allowed him to influence me without emulating him, I would get the, res the desired result. So it's actually, you've got to hardwire your brain in a different way and allow it to become an influence as opposed to trying to replicate what the person's done. Because it's done. It's there. He's yeah, well, there's, a, there's a, a great quote from, I can't remember his name, Trumpeter, <clears throat> and he says, and it's quite like brief, but it's poignant, that as a musician, we should all imitate initially Simulate as much, imitate from as many artists mm. as possible, and then you innovate. Sting said that as well. He said like, like yeah. something along the lines That's of from the jazz discipline, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And even but before then, I remember. What Trump? Well, that summer, yeah. musicology class, 
and the musicologist actually went into research of how that process happened and, and there was a whole chapter on what he called turning knobs. It's like there's a feed going through your brain of everything that you've experienced musically or otherwise, whatever you use to take meaning and, and, and put it in your own way. And it's just like you're at a mixing desk turning knobs and changing that into how you would have it perceived by others. So um, it's, it's, I, I feel like it's that sort of idea. There's no original, uh, there's no such thing as a purely original idea. It's no. everything that you've taken in. And that's unique to you from your perspective. And you just sort of turn the knobs and change some things and you get your own mix and you send that out into the world. Okay, yeah, I completely agree. Okay, so on that note, what are, what are people on Facebook saying? Are we still live streaming? I think I've got a phone we call. Are, we are, we are still live streaming. I think I've got a phone There's, call in the middle of that. There is a question here. There's a question here directed for, at Khan. And I think it kind of linked to the topic of when we were talking about bands and sort of what happened and the whole Detroit Rock City thing. Uh, Donny van Gent over here, a question for Khan. Of all of the collabs you did with artists, there was a song called Deadlines with Evolver. What happened to them? What happened to them since then? I haven't heard anything from them. Did most bands stop after the MCAR era? Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, so there's like 42 <laughs> questions there, but um, yes, I did do a song with them. Uh, the singer, Pete, kind of left the band and he uh, moved to Cape Town and he uh, got super hot and became like a model. And uh, I, think, I think he even went to Europe and is modeling. And then uh, they tried to kind of <clears throat> carry it on and, you know, they had various vocalists, but I think they eventually... Yeah, they kind of realized that, you know, again, you know, losing the front man is quite difficult to replace. Yeah. That, um, but MCAR, guys. No, MCAR, no, 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 was MCAR was a massive thing. The MCAR generation, I mean, that was, a, that was more than just a music channel. Mm. It was uh, it was a it was a culture. Um, you know, you went to Opie Copy, uh, you went to Splash FM, and you went to those things. And the people from MCAR that watched you every day, that you were basically broadcast into their house twenty four hours a day. I kept MCAR on all of the time. It played in the back. That's, there's an example of the outlier example. Is you've got a whole bunch of great bands at a time, but there's suddenly a vehicle to present them to South African audience, which was MK. And I mean, there's still a lot of bands today that are still thriving that got that kickstart. Guys, let's turn this into no. the new M car. We need. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. Now there's plenty, yeah. plenty, yeah. plenty yeah. bands out there that, that are amazing. Amazing. But they dude. can't. Amazing. There's, there's, they, they can't get that mass audience. You know, I look at a band on the top of my head, a band called Opposite the Other. If you haven't heard Opposite the Other, you have missed out on on a sonic orgasm. There are a bunch of young <laughs> lighties. <laughs> Everyone's laughing, but there are a bunch of lighties from Cape Town that are masterful. They are just masterful and, and, and amazing. And they've got such a cool, fresh sound. And they don't sound local, but I don't know if that's a bad thing. Is local a lack? Is local is lack? Is it a derogatory term? Lack, local, lack, local? No, no. Yeah, I've heard that no. conversation before, actually, when people Does were like, well, doesn't mean that if it's local, it's subpar, but we're proud of it, or is it supposed to sound <laughs> international standard if it's not local? What, what does it mean? So I think there's two sides to that conversation. The amount of people that come up to me and go like, oh, like, I didn't <laughs> even know you were from South Africa, man. <laughs> and you're like, well, does it matter? Like, I know yeah. that it's cool that you think, like, you, yeah, yeah, you, you know what I mean? International. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I think it stems from uh, the tastemakers. But I think that's what you alluded to earlier. Is, is too often in this country, the tastemakers, which is the big, it's the, either the radio platform or the television platform or the, the, the big um, live scene, tend to kind of favor the international artist. I mean, until quotas were introduced, which are still too low in my opinion, um, radio I predominantly agree. played international artists. So of course, Who's, who's, getting, who's getting all the... Who's getting the spotlight? And, and the and the let's just have a look right now, because that, that point right there, I think, is like... Sure, it's, it's nearly a <coughs> nail right on the head, right? Because if you look at the Afrikaans music scene, mm -hmm. uh, the Kosa music scene, the Zulu Venda, any of the ethnicities that we have in our country, they compete within them, their own small bubble, because 
Nowhere else in the world are those languages spoken. They might be consumed, but not necessarily spoken. There isn't that culture there. Yeah. So they only really compete within their own circles. So it becomes a little bit, yes, the, yes, the, 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 the scene might be smaller, but it's actually not. You know what I mean? It's the yeah. same size as the music industry, but we sing in English. We compete with the rest of the world immediately. Yeah. We have yeah. to compete with Beyonce because people just make that association. Or whoever, Bonova, whoever the hell you listen to, it doesn't matter. Mm. As soon as you sing in English, you compete with the rest of the world. Just yeah. like if you sing in Spanish, you might only compete with a very small sector. So maybe, I mean, do you write an, are you Afrikaans? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I guess Afrikaans. Yeah, and, and I was just about to say, as men to say, local is lacquer. It depends on what they do with their hands when they say lacquer. Hey, like Chuma. if you must be careful if they have a lot of hand movements on the lacquer then it might be something like what Kyle was mentioning. It's local and we're proud of it, but it doesn't necessarily yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think the I think the South African sound is actually fairly strong. I mean, being a music dog, we often talk about the harmonic progressions as a one four five piece or something yeah. along the one four five lines, which is an African progression. Very Always in G thing. somehow, eh? Yeah, and we'll, we'll we'll definitely make a turn there at at, at the G. Um, so what happens is that sound, and I'm talking about if we go back to Matlatini and the Mohutela Queens, and we go back to when those artists had to um, tour the world during the boycott of South Africa um, pre ninety four there was a certain sound that already started crystallizing there and personally I feel that there is a lot more still to explore there. Part of my, my project, the Armour Franks project, is aimed at at least going and mining some of that Afri South African specific sound because we've got the west of our continent, we've got the east and the north of our continent, all with vastly different flavors. I completely agree with you, but how does one do that Successfully, without running the risk of being like that guy, you know, is now trying to do. I'm going to do a Zulu song, bro. Yeah, you, know, you, you have to employ you, Lady Smith, Black Mombasa. Yeah, yeah. John, Johnny um, Clegg nailed it. Johnny Clegg represents something so special. But it was entrenched, and he was. He was. It was honest. It was it real. Was original. Um, yeah. What's the name? PJ Powers. Who? Thank you, 1995 World Cup. PJ Powers. Thank you, Auntie. Like, um, and then we look at Brenda Fussy, who again, kind of, she was like, she kind of crossed the, she crossed the barrier line as well, but from the other side, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So how do you do that without, this is looking like a complete no, thing? I, I think, I think you, you have your own measurement already there. You, you will be engaging in that, and if right off the bat you feel like a complete fool, explore something else. Tap like, out, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. It, 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 go for something that is really exciting for you, like, I do um, collaborations with my uh, Spady friends in Pretoria, and sometimes they don't want to speak Spady either. They will say, in this house track, we want some Zulu. Yeah. And we'll go and we'll oh. get a legit Zulu to come and oh. lay down that track because we want that flavor, we want to mix Siatlanga Yes. That's the vibe. And look at Kanatori as well, doing mad things overseas. And and really just kind of, uh, such an interesting sound, do you know? Mm. Yeah, like such an interesting sound, like kind of this cross-pollinating, uh, uh, an acoustic vibe to this like more digital, to this just harmonic like, oh, oh, and then coming kind of with this high-pitched vocal, it's beautiful, man. It's kind of like our sort of, uh, yeah, it's, it's beautiful, it is taking that African thing. But even Pretoria, the Pretoria rock scene, for example, has got such a, cool sound yeah. to it. It's, it's distinctly Pretoria. You know? Yeah, yeah. there was definitely a lot of acts. I mean, um, back in the day when Isochronous was still full oh. name, Isochronous. Ooh, I missed and, um, that band. Yeah. Jeez. That was prog rock. Like, the, the, the gents were very interested in progressive rock and um, bands that would actually be in their own space. Like, I know a lot of people are Tool fans and sometimes it's actually hard to also pin down what exactly that sound is. So the Praetorians, I think, a lot of them, were very inspired, and it's not exclusive to them, but they were very inspired with progressive music. Their medium was just rock. So they wanted to play drum kit, they wanted to have amps, and they wanted to have some distortion. But actually what I think we all actually like is progressive music as a phenomenon exactly. in general. It's music no matter where it's coming it excites from. you. I mean, your ears prick up when you hear something new, you know, yeah. you're like, oh my goodness, uh, that's not like anything else, but it also, it works, yeah. you know, because things can be like nothing else and be awful, mm. but when something's like nothing else and it's just honest, queen, perfect example. Keep wanting to say that is. Yeah. 
Exactly. Every time you say nothing else. Nothing, nothing else matters. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, we've got a couple of oh, no. <laughs> Firstly, it seems like people are fans of Frank's shoes. <laughs> like your shoes they buy. Once, yeah. one of a kind, everybody. And, uh, and secondly, there are quite a few comments that are eagerly waiting to hear Mr. Khan. All right. Movie. Same here. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so what are you what are you, you going to sing? Dry mistake. Dry mistake. Yeah. All right. Okay. Cool. So we'll be back just just now now, and then we're going to do dry mistake. We're going to talk about it afterwards. Ciao. So we lost uh, signal because um, our cameraman fell over. Lindor? <laughs> Lindor? <laughs> it was supposed to be gigantic. <laughs> gigantic. Gigantic. <laughs> gigantic. Take a bow, buddy. <laughs> so, yeah, man. One of the... One of the most iconic songs, I think, in SA's history, and I mean that with all honesty, I really do. Um, you guys have a knack for that, for writing those, those tracks, the ones that make you feel feelings. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm, I still think, though, just hear me out, Spur, if you're listening, <clears throat> I think that if you took that song and went, it was a giant Spur day, gigantic, <laughs> there were chips on the plate, you know, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just feeling a sync placement here, guys. I'm just, that's what I'm feeling. I just want 20%. That's all I'm asking. Yeah, man, but all, all seriously, great song. Um, message behind it? Reasoning behind it? Uh, uh, well, I'll talk you through the song. Please, please. It's quite a cool uh, story to it. So, please. Uh, like, you know, like, like I told the lead to it, I kind of become the foundation of the song, which is the verse and chorus. And we had this, um, this riff. So, the cool, interesting thing is the song is in D. The riff that he wrote is actually. Everyone loves the D. Yeah, it's actually E. It's bad. Yeah. Which somehow works out of the chorus, which is in D. Um, and. Maybe you can talk us through. Yeah, no, there's a reason for that, but. Paul does, Paul does quite a cool thing as well, uh, which is a trick that he do all the time, um, because neither him or I can play very intricate solos, so yeah. if you can't, you, the way that you cheat mm. is to make it sound like that is to play, play a, 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 an open chord in unison. Yeah. So instead of going, yeah. he goes, that's it. Yeah, man. So it kind of it fills it up and it, and it sings a bit better. Mm. And then he uh, kind of what I referred to earlier about um, imitating or simulating, you know, your collective universe. Mm -hmm. There's so much in that song. So um, I brought this book along. I brought this book when we were initially... Total Guitar of the Beatles. Yeah, yeah. so the roots of the Beatles summarize the secrets. <laughs> uh, 
Mm. So, as a song I know, for me, it's about finding shortcuts, not going through the <laughs> theoretical wormhole. Uh, and shortcuts are often guys going, the song works because of this. And, and these are the, the chords that work, and here's why. And I was like, started reading that, and I think I must have written about 20 songs with something that's known as the Who Ops Act. Yes. Um, I don't exactly know what the numbers are, but I'll be there pushing to the floor, mm. burning flights. Um, I mean, I could whistle, I could whistle 20 if I had to kind of yes. teach the vibe, but it all goes to stats. Was it two? I thought I heard four, but I couldn't see it. One six two five. One six two, one, six, two five. five for you academics out there. The, the, the Beatles, two up. The Beatles series is often an album massively is that they are like if they're cool, so it's kind of my go-to whenever I'm stuck with what chords to put on that do up cycle. And um, so another reason why that song kind of works is although it's in D, there's this intro that's in E, the verses is in E, or it starts in G. The first time that you actually hear a D is in the chorus. And uh, there's a scene in songwriting where they, they talk about the, the going home, which is your roof notes. Um, it's exciting music, it's all about creating tension. Yeah. And, and the way that you do it with, with chords is to kind of delay going home. Yeah. Um, so Hey, can you just explain that as well, like going home, for people that don't know. So, for example, if you start in the G chord, and then maybe you go to E minor, D, C, or C major 7, you go back to the G, you resolve it. So you're going home the whole time. Yeah. doesn't matter how complex the journey is, as long as you come home at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, people go, yeah. Oh, yeah. Abdullah Ibrahim actually spoke in those words of going home and going to the subdominant feels like you're going somewhere else in the dominant, somewhere else. But when you come home to your tonic, it <sighs> gives the feeling of Completion, that release, yeah. you know. So just on that, yeah. sorry, very quickly. Do you know how Mozart's mom used to get him out of bed in the morning? She would go to the piano and go, do 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 and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd run and go, <laughs> he couldn't, he couldn't. Drive me mad. Yo, yeah. oh, I don't know how true that is. I was going mad just waiting for you to resolve it. But I love that story. I love that story. It's just like you could like, resolve it, mom. You know, so, so yeah. for all of the parents out there whose kids are on opium, <laughs> I'm out of bed. <laughs> yeah. no, but sorry to interrupt you, carry on. No, um, so when Gary wrote that book, um, us, uh, so let me go back a bit. We all some of kind of share a common love for Radiohead. Yes. And um, one of the stories I was reading about Radiohead, they, they were very inspired by the Pixies. So I um, also became a massive fan of the Pixies. And when Glenn started playing that book, I think he said, Yes, well. I can't remember how many more and vocal operations and everything. Um, that was higher than uh, that was high, even higher for anyone in this room. I, yeah, yeah, I think I think and it was higher than what you needed to go. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So, but but um, you mentioned Mark earlier. Yeah. On the recording, it's Inga and I. Yeah. The voices are being in. Uh -huh. Um So that was a, a Pixies sort of um, reference. The opening Dudu is kind of a, a Pixies and Radiohead reference. Mm -hmm. um, Time we were recording, I think Paul was reading a book on in excess, and uh, if you kind of keep telling me about uh, little anecdotes or stories that happened in, in the book, and one of them was um, when they were. Sorry to interrupt you there, Khan. Yeah. People are struggling to hear you. Could you lean back oh, towards okay, Cyril? Okay, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. Uncle Should Cyril. Repeat all of that stuff there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, yes. yeah. <laughs> hey, we take it from NXS. We take it from NXS. So, <clears throat> that, you know, years ago when they, they won some Brit award and um, uh, I think it was Liam Gallagher was presenting the award and when they went to get it, um, he, he kind of said, oh, you guys are has-beens or, or whatever. So, it um, obviously affected Michael Hutchinson. He was a bit upset about it. So, the one that they were recording, the song Elegantly Wasted, 
And um, in the studio, when everyone left, he went and did the backing vocals. And instead of going, oh, elevate, he wasted, he, said, he changed it to, oh, we're better than Oasis. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the story. But Because um, often you have unfinished lyrics, but that then became... The second part of the verse. Hey, and again, you wasted, tasted more. Mm. It was so a great kinda, line, though. It's well. kind of how these yeah. little, little things. See, isn't that, isn't that fantastic? Like, you see that, guys. You know, a lot of people ask us, like, like for example, I've just released a new track now called Sober, and ironically, during lockdown and all that jazz, you know. And everyone came up to me and like, were like, or messaging me, friend, and be going, Oh, Shane, is everything all right today? <laughs> you know? And I was like, Oh, no, my kid, my, kid, my wife's having a bad time. But it's not, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but so you are okay. Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Please help. Um, uh, but it's like, not... like, it's little things like that. Like, you don't necessarily sit down and write the story about a personal kind of thing that happened to you, you maybe take it and grow it into something else. Um, when I studied theater, there was a guy called Stanislavski, and he was um, kind of like an acting coach in a sense, and he developed a, a style of acting uh, called realism, which was trying to be as real as possible. You know, like if you're playing somebody whose father's just passed away and uh, you had to really get that emotion, but how do you do that if you've never experienced that? If your dad's still alive. And he said, well, you maybe take a past experience of a cat dying and superimpose that emotion onto the event. And that's effectively, I think, what musicians do in a sense. We superimpose the feeling and then apply the lyrics to kind of accompany and narrate mm. how you feel and how the song makes you feel. I don't know if I'm incorrect. Yeah, the, narr right, yeah. the narrative element for me is very important. And I just also want to say that we've actually now etched out two different narrative elements because we were talking about the journey of being at home traveling musically in a harmonic sense and, uh, and arriving again and that certainly is a narr narration and now you're talking about like the, the marriage between lyrics and melody and Absolutely. how that is a narration also within itself so there's maybe something to be said about song writing in terms of those wow. two different nice. narratives message there <laughs> yeah there we go someone's not watching the stream of these that's fun <laughs> sorry Candy yeah. yeah, no, sorry. No, we should actually, we should actually wrap up uh, quite shortly. Um, but yeah, just on that, absolutely. You know, um, it is about it is about putting those elements together. You know, and, and the great songs yeah, that that they have them all working almost seamlessly together. Ultimately, yeah. yeah. And that's what I think makes a great song. You know, and what makes a song timeless. You know, um, uh, is everything, all of those elements working together. So I mean, yeah. as, a, as a young songwriter out there. You know, you, you, you're being privy to something quite, quite, quite special here because to learn how to write a song is not just technical, but it's not just an emotional, it's not just experiences. You can be young and naive, but emotionally very sort of uh, mature and write a, a really powerful song. Uh, so I think don't uh, discredit your writings and don't be too hard on yourselves. Be honest, be an honest songwriter, be an honest creative. Uh, be prepared to fail um, and accept failure because when the success does come, it'll be that much sweeter. Am I wrong? No, you're right. Hundred percent right. <laughs> That's why they pay me the big bucks. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. It really has been a privilege and a pleasure being inside of your lounge. Uh, love what you've done with the place. Um, Thank you very much to Kyle. Uh, hopefully we see you guys again. If you like this, please send us yeses and noes. Um, if you want us to do this again, please let us know. Um, yes, thank you so much to our sponsors. Um, we have none. Hopefully we can get a few. Um, on that busker code, guys, you literally scan it. It's like a snap scan or a zapper. And donate, keep us afloat, and uh, help feed uh, Khan's kids, because that's important. All right. We <laughs> love you very much. <laughs> Gents, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody, this was thank the you. first thank one. You, thank you, uh, Hopefully it will be many. Cheers, guys. Thank you,